A. U. C. D. G. Y. L. P. O. K. Greetings one and all, and welcome back to Tom's Hit Parade. Today I will be presenting the second installment of the first cycle of Tom's A to Z in which I take a look at one album by one artist from each letter of the alphabet, more or less, over the course of the year. And the theme this year is the $1 LP section in House of Records, which is a store in Eugene, Oregon that I love to browse around and shop in. At some point soon, I plan on uh, taking you there on a visit uh, in a special video, so keep an eye out for that. It's a wonderful, fun little store. Uh, anyway, in the last video, the first episode in this series, I took a look at an albums by artists beginning with the letter A and B. And so today's video will be artists beginning with the letter C and D. And the artist that I have chosen to represent the letter C this time around is Terry Lynn Carrington. Now, I have no idea how I didn't know about this artist until now, uh, considering the list of credits of uh, people that she's worked with over the years. Well, I guess in a way, well, she's a jazz artist, and so jazz is not my number one field of interest. I've only gotten measurably into jazz in the last two or three years, so that kind of explains why I didn't know about her, but but still. Just uh, when you think about the list of credits she's worked with, uh, Dizzy Gillespie, Stan Getz, Herbie Hancock, Al Jarreau, The Yellow Jackets, Esperanza Spalding, Liz Wright, Angelique Kijo, and the list goes on and on. And uh, she was also a drummer for the Arsenio Hall Show, how, uh, the house band of the Arsenio Hall Show, back in the late 80s and early 90s. And uh, she comes from a very musical background. Uh, look at her uh, biography on Wikipedia. It's fascinating. Uh, her father was a saxophonist and the president of the Boston Jazz Society. And at age seven, she inherited her grandfather's drum set. Her grandfather had played with Fats Waller. So, yeah, I mean, the, the biography just gets more interesting from there. So check it out on Wikipedia. But anyway, yeah, the thing that fascinated me that caught my eye about this album was the hype sticker here. Uh, the extraordinary de debut album by drummer-composer-vocalist Terry Lynn Carrington. So yeah, a female drummer of color. And there are not very many of those out there in the world. Sheila E. is pretty much the only other female drummer of any color that I, I know about that has any measurable prominence in the music world. So uh, yeah, that's what really caught my interest about this album. And I'm kind of glad I picked it up. Uh, it's very, very interesting. And I, I mentioned the list of credits that she's worked with uh, over her career a minute ago. Just the list of guest stars on this album is pretty freaking amazing. Gerald Albright, Diane Reeves, Patrice Russian, Carlos Santana appears on this album, as well as saxophonists Wayne Shorter and Grover Washington Jr. So, I mean, this is pretty, pretty much an all-star cast on this album. And it's her debut album, so... Uh, by that measure, I, th I think she had already by this time it had a bit of a, a bit of clout in the music industry, which is why I think she was able to assemble such a huge list of names for this. And this is a pretty darn good album, honestly. Um, I really enjoy it. It's a mixture of about 40% vocal songs and the other 60% are instrumental, but all the songs on the album showcase her drumming as they darn well ought to. She's a fantastic drummer, honestly, and uh, it's just, yeah, it's just a fantastic album. Uh, one of the highlights on the album is uh, the final track on side A, which is called Shh. And that's, it was written by Patrice Russian, and that's a sprawling, kind of a moody tr uh, song, and it's, it's, it's really good, and it, it brings to the forefront Cherry Lynn Carrington's drumming skills. It's just a fantastic instrumental. Uh, it's not particularly long. It's 5 minutes, 15 seconds, so it's not really long, but it's, it's very moody. It's, it's a really good song to, uh, to check out. And uh, the song right before that is an instrumental rendition of the Lennon and McCartney song Blackbird which is a very good rendition of that. Uh, but pretty much, uh, yeah, besides those two, every other song on the album was written by Terry Lynn Carrington. So that uh, uh, really gives her a good showcase of her songwriting skills. So it's just a fantastic album. Um, and as I said, about 40% of the songs are vocal. One of those is More Than a Woman, which is a very, very sultry love song. And uh, as with a lot of vocal-based jazz songs from the late 80s, this album was done in 1989, uh, they're kind of on the R&B side of uh, Sonic Palette, I guess you'd say. It's a, but yeah, that's a very good song, and uh, she actually sings in that song, More Than a Woman. Very, very good song. And uh, But pretty much all the other songs are instrumental. I think there might be one other song that's vocal, like, which I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, Obstacle Illusion, which uh, kicks off side B, that's a really, really cool song. It's an upbeat track with uh, that perhaps has the most uh, synths 
synth-based keyboards of any of the songs in the album. Uh, a lot, of, most of the other songs are pretty much uh, the acoustic or more traditional instrumentation. Uh, Human Revolution is a song which is actually right after Obstacle Illusion, and it has a pretty good uh, electric guitar, so it's a really rock-based song. And I think that might be the only song with electric guitars in it, if I remember correctly. But uh, yeah, uh, as you can see, a wide variety of uh, sounds on this album. Uh, the final track, Pleasant Dreams, is a very, very good closer. It's a gorgeous, intimate, acoustic, small jazz combo kind of tune. It's just a very, very lovely way to close the album. So, yeah, if you like jazz with a slight little R&B touch from a very talented composer and drummer, if you like drum work, this is an album to check out. Terry Lynn Carrington, Real Life Story is her debut album. And oh, and uh, one thing I forgot to mention, she is actually, uh, she's won three Grammys over the years, one of which uh, was in 2013, the first female artist to ever to win Best Jazz Instrumental Album was Terry Lynn Carrington. Not for this album, but for her 2013 album. So that's another, uh, you know, point to rack up on her, uh, her list of accomplishments and her list of firsts in the music industry. So, uh, yeah, check out Terry Lynn Carrington. I highly recommend, uh, and, and I think I'm going to check her out further, uh, cause this album, my first taste of her was, uh, just pretty darn good. So yeah, check her out. Okay. And moving along through the alphabet, we come to the letter D and D in this case brings us to Lisa Dalbello. Yeah. It's all about the women today, isn't it? Lisa Dalbello hails from Toronto, Canada. And she has a pretty impressive list of credits, too, along with Terry Lynn Carrington. Lisa has sung backup on albums by Alex Lifeson of Rush, Boz Skaggs, Cher, Richard Marks, Hart, Toto, Alice Cooper, Patti LaBelle, and again, the list goes on. And she has also written and produced for some of these artists as well as others. So, yeah, she's got the cred, too, as well. So, uh, And she's actually been nominated five times for the Juno Award for Female Vocalist of the Year. This was back in the 80s. And she actually won in her first year for Most Promising Female Vocalist. And forgive me, but I cannot remember if it was for this album or if it, or if it was for another one. But uh, anyway, this is her third album, by the way, Drastic Measures. Now, as far as the sound of this album, if you basically think uh, Pat Benatar, Laura Branigan, Sheena Easton, the slightly rock-leaning female pop vocalists of the early 80s. This spot kind of falls in line with that. Uh, but yeah, it's a very good album. I, I like it. Uh, probably not as good as Terry Lynn Carrington's, but still pretty darn good. Uh, three of the songs on side one were actually co-written with fellow Canadian Brian Adams, so a, a significant songwriting credit on here. Although she actually writes, uh, co-writes pretty much all the other songs with Tim Thorny, who's a, a songwriting producer, uh, partner of hers. He, no, he didn't produce the album, but yeah, he just uh, was the principal co-writer with Lisa Del Bello. And uh, also a, a significant uh, performing credit on this album is Jeff Baxter, who uh, was uh, made a career of his own, a, a name for himself with Steely Dan and the Doobie Brothers, among others. So yeah, he plays guitar on a couple of tracks on this album. So yeah, this has got the, uh, this has got some names with it as well. So very good album. Uh, probably the standout track for me is Princess Telephone, which is on side one. It's just a great, a great song. It, it reminds me of Stranger Era Billy Joel, uh, particularly the song, the song Moving Out of his. Uh, it's, got a, it's got a strong resemblance to that. Uh, it's, it's not plagiarizing it. It's just, you know, kind of the sound of it brought to mind Moving Out. And it's interesting that I would mention The Stranger because another song on this album, It's Over, has a restaurant scenario in its lyrics, which brings to mind scenes from an Italian, Italian restaurant. So kind of a, a s s very minor Billy Joel thread, if you will, kind of running through this album. But yeah, it's just a, a very good album, as I said. Uh, another song that's uh, caught my ear is Bad Timing. It, that's pro probably my second favorite album, um, second favorite song on the album. But yeah, it's just, it's it's got some good stuff on it. Uh, I especially for one dollar the bargain basement price that i paid for it it's, it was a good album it was an entertaining album i have to say and i mean i i personally i like the pat banatar sheena easton laura branding and kind of stuff anyway so uh, this kind of played into that with that particular wheelhouse of mine my interests so yeah if you happen upon drastic measures uh, the third album by lisa dalbello check it out oh and she's actually um uh, since this album, she kind of followed a career trajectory, well, not really followed because she did it before Alanis Morissette, but she kind of, because uh, she started out more in the pop uh, genre and later on a couple albums after this one, or maybe the next album after this one, I can't remember, she took on more of a alt-rock kind of a thing, uh, kind of a sound, and she actually changed her uh, stage name just to Dalbello with no space in it. 
so that that's what she was known by in the, the later stage of her career so uh but yeah it's uh, an interesting uh, an interesting album i'm thinking about uh keeping an eye out for her uh, other releases if i ever happen upon them so yeah another interesting fun set of albums for a to z and some more interesting stuff i learned about artists that uh, i didn't know about before at all so yeah this has been a fun series and i'm looking forward to continuing it well there you have it for episode two of tom's a to z i hope you guys have been having as much fun as i have learning more about artists that i didn't know about before it's just been a whole lot of fun and anyway that's it for this video i hope you enjoyed it suggestions questions constructive criticisms lay them on me in the comment section below also, scroll down to the description for the link to my Twitter feed and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and check out my past videos, and be sure to ring that notification bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.